Thanks, Nick. It looks okay for a minute. It looks frozen. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are uh, in the world. Uh, welcome to our monthly breakfast for dispute resolvers. I'm Maria Volpe. I'm a professor at John Jay College. These breakfasts are sponsored every month by the Association for Conflict Resolution of Greater New York and the City University of New York Dispute Resolution Center at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Today marks a very special anniversary for us. This is our 20th year. Um, had it not been for 9-11, we might not be here today. Um, conflict resolvers were asking, what can we do in response to 9-11? And um, for those of us in New York, that was an incredibly tragic day. The uh, major attacks were in our city. But we also would not be here today if it wasn't for Julie Denny. Um, by 2007, I had decided that after six years of talking about what we could do in response to 9-11 and uh, holding monthly breakfast, um, we should probably just move forward ourselves. And Julie was then president of ACR GNY and pulled me aside after I said, you know, this is our last breakfast, May 2007, and said, um, we can't stop holding these breakfasts now. Um, what if ACR GNY joined uh, the CUNY Dispute Resolution Center and we co-sponsored them? And that felt like such a wonderful reintroduction of the breakfast to have a co-sponsor <clears throat> that would share all of the uh, responsibilities that go with putting these on every month. So uh, thank you, Julie, for uh, keeping us going. And here we all are 20 years later um, with another you know, incredibly tragic um, situation, COVID-19. So these 20 years have really been bookended. Um, we met in person from 9-11 until uh, March 2020, since April. Um, this is now our 18th online breakfast. All of the recordings are posted on uh, www.acrgmy.org each month. So um, for anyone who would like to see replays since April, please uh, go to the ACRGMY website. Anthony's breakfast would not now be possible every month if it wasn't for our wonderful team, which includes Julie, Chuck Newman, Matthew Latimer, and Nikki Borofsky. Uh, thank you everyone for being co-conveners and co-creators and co-facilitators every month. So, I'm not going to take any more minutes to talk about um, uh, you know, our, our 20 years. We'll, we'll do that at the end of um, our breakfast. We're so delighted that we have with us um, John Wood to um, mark this very special milestone. We always talk about making talk work as conflict resolvers, and Braver Angels is um, doing that. And um, so it, it's just the perfect um, morning for us to hear um, what Braver Angels is doing. Thank you so much, John, for joining us. And Julie will now do a more formal introduction uh, of our speaker. Thanks, Maria. I will, but before I do that, uh, you mentioned that I was once president of ACRGNY. And we want all of you who are online with us today to know that if you are not members, you can join for a $50 a year membership fee. ACRGNY offers different programs, not only co-sponsoring these breakfasts, but they also have some practice groups. Uh, and there are two coming up. One is on family and divorce mediation. And Chuck, help me. What's the second one? Commercial? I think it's commercial and employment. Right. 
you can find out all kinds of information about ACRGNY on their website, which is not surprisingly acrgny.org. That's our pitch for a wonderful organization. Let's talk about John Wood. He's a national ambassador for Braver Angels, and he's a noted writer and speaker on subjects from moral philosophy to racial and political reconciliation. His written work has appeared in publications like the Wall Street Journal, Real Clear Politics, the Washington Examiner, Reflections, which is a journal of the Yale School of Divinity. And boy, John, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing this one correctly, Kiet or Quillette. He'll tell us. He's a former nominee for Congress, former vice chairman of the Republican Party of Los Angeles County, and he lives in Los Angeles with his wife and three children. He's joining us right now from Orlando, Florida, where he's at a conference, and he needs to leave at 9.45. Um, so we'll segue back into a little bit of a discussion at 9.45. John has to leave us. Take it away, John. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you, Maria, Chuck, and everybody uh, for, for joining this call. And I really appreciate the, the warm and gracious introduction. Uh, and yeah, I apologize for having to leave a bit, uh, leave a bit early. Um, you guys know how it is rushing from you know, conferences and hotel rooms to try and make planes on time. And I I realized that uh, the way the schedules fell, um, I was <laughs> I was at risk of not getting back home uh, when I uh, when I was supposed to. And of course, uh, you know, Mrs. Wood would be none too pleased about that. I've been gone too long as it is. Um, but it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you folks. It's a pleasure to get the opportunity to speak to you all and to meet you all. Um, I consider this to be a special group of people because it does take uh, a little bit of a special personality, I think, to want to put yourself in the gaps or in the space between other individuals and groups in the moments of conflict. Um, we have to have this patience and the moral, emotional, and spiritual endurance, if you will, uh, to be able to, to see what motivates people, to see the good in people, to see people's capacity for understanding and to be a constructive partner in helping to lead them towards the point of being able to empathize with the perspectives of the person on the other side of the disagreement. And sometimes our disagreements are not particularly polite and civil. Sometimes our disagreements uh, are deep and intense and <clears throat> they can even relate to matters of life and death. And so, you know, this is a group of, of people, uh, folks on this call who it seems to me are willing to put themselves in those spaces. And that's something that we, that we have in common. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I wanna talk, uh, of course, about the work of Braver Angels, what it is we do, the philosophy that, that guides us and, and take a few of your questions and, and even say a little bit about how people on this call who may not be familiar with us can get involved. But I, I do wanna speak a little bit uh, to start with to the, um, the context for this particular gathering. I understand that this is the 20th anniversary of this, uh, this, this, this assembly and that it is an anniversary, of course, uh, marked by the date of September 11th is on the horizon here. And uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's funny, we, live in a moment in time where of course polarization, political, cultural, social uh, has reached a dangerous uh, sort of, I would say tipping point, but many people would argue that we've gone well past the tipping point, that we have tipped into something, right? And I guess the question becomes, can we, can we tip back or can we tip forward uh, in a way that delivers us to a more stable ground? Um, you know, I, I am, uh, I'm 34 years old. I remember, um, I, I've always been very much interested in politics, even as a 
little kid. And I, I remember having concerns about the divisions in American society back during the, the, the Clinton impeachment uh, saga. I remember people in the 90s talking about how, oh, don't, don't, we, don't we miss the days when Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill could, could signal their friendship to the American people. Now we have Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich and so forth. And, and these, these uh, you know, these, uh, these, these conflicts in Washington that are spilling out to, to American conversation. But when 9-11 took place, and I, I remember it vividly, granted I was in Los Angeles and it was an entirely different, I think, sort of category of experience for, for, for folks in New York. You've got, you've got an awful lot of New Yorkers on this call, of course. Nevertheless, um, I remember it was an interesting, it's an interesting thing. I, 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 um, I got up that morning, it was a school day, of course, can't remember what day of the week it was, so I'm sure uh, many of you folks will recall. And um, I was a sophomore in high school. And um, I, my parents were separated, and I'll talk a bit about my parents and my family uh, in a moment here, because they're sort of relevant to my story, of course. And um, I um, usually, my, my father would come and pick us up in the morning from my mother's place uh, to, from our mother's apartment to, to take me and my brother to school. And I was not in the habit of watching the news. I was not in the habit of watching television in the morning. But on that particular morning, for some reason, um, I woke up a little bit earlier than I usually did. Um, and you know, I was usually a kid who you had to shake to get up to get ready to go to school, <laughs> even at that age. But I woke up a little bit earlier than I usually did. And I thought, let me turn on the television. And I walked into the other room, I turned on the TV um, to the news inexplicably and saw the, um, the towers burning. And I looked at that, I blinked a couple of times and I walked out of the room just sort of thinking like, hmm, you know, uh, another morning, things going on. And then I, I, I took a few steps into the hallway and I said, wait a second, what did I just see? And I, I, I turned around and I went back to the TV. I went back to the TV and I, I looked at it. And I just stared, you know, headlines, planes crashed into the, into, the, uh, into the towers, possible terrorist attack and so forth. And I just sort of blinked at it in, in, in disbelief. And um, suddenly the phone rang. My uncle was more like my cousin because he was a year older than me and went to the same high school. And he called me on the phone and said, John, are you watching the news? Um, my dad arrived to pick us up, but he didn't take us directly uh, to class. Instead, we just sort of drove around in the car, sort of aimlessly, my dad listening to the radio. And with this profound sort of agonized look, worry, consternation, my dad was sort of, you know, he was sort of talking, sort of, you know, I can't remember everything he, he said, but, but fearing that you know, things would never be the same in America, in our country, um, sort of thinking out loud about terrible things that might be about to happen. We went to the grocery store. I don't think we needed anything, but we wandered around in there too for a moment. Other people were walking around with these ghostly, ghostly looks on their faces. Um, and finally, my dad did take us to class. I got to my second period history class about halfway through. Other people were just getting there too. I saw my my um, history teacher. Um, she was a somewhat stoic personality, but I could see I, I could see the, uh, I could I could see that she had been wiping tears from her face. And um, and we all did our best to to sort of fit into the, uh, into our routine. But, you know, we were all going through the motions uh, at best. But in the aftermath, of course, in, in, the, in the immediate aftermath of, of 9-11, something happened that felt, um, felt remarkable. 
you know, the context of American life at that time. And, you know, and, and, and I say this without wishing to gloss over the fact that, you know, this was a moment in which it was immediately evident for those who were in a position to observe it that certain groups of folks in our country, certain people from the Middle East, people of Muslim and, and Sikh and, and Hindu and other Eastern religious uh, orientations would find themselves singled out, made victims of by narrow-minded and sort of perversely patriotic folks in our in our country. There's a whole storyline there that is easy to forget when we reminisce about the immediate aftermath of 9-11. I, I want to honor that reality by mentioning it here. But something amazing happened. And that was the fact that for the first time in my life, I suddenly saw people from across the spectrum of American experience in my local community. I was in Culver City, California, by the way, but on television, whether we were watching CNN or Fox News, people were rallying together as Americans. People were expressing their commitment to this country, to each other. We were celebrating the stories of heroism, first responders who had rushed bravely into the burning towers, saved their fellow Americans, white, black, Jewish, Muslim, immigrant, native born, uh, the American people rallied together in New York to help each other and inspired the rest of the country. And for this brief shining moment in time to have this feeling that we really were all Americans and that there was something that united us, something that bound us as a family, that, that put the significances of our differences into a larger context of our shared humanity. And for a brief moment, you know, that unity persisted and it felt deep and it felt real. And we remember that fondly, I think, many of us, for so long as it lasted. It didn't last too terribly long. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Julia uh, read my uh, political credentials and so forth. But, you know, I, um, I cut my teeth in, in politics um, as an activist in high school protest the Iraq war. And that's not something that I regret. Not that I want to make this about my personal politics here, but my views on those sorts of subjects haven't changed too terribly much since then. Um, but I, uh, you know, I, I was a young person who was, felt himself in radical opposition to, <laughs> to George Bush. And my, uh, my heart was broken by what I felt like demonization of activists and people who were striving for peace, people who certainly wanted justice from 9-11 and wanted to defend the security of our nation, but who thought that the, the sort of raking over the coals of people that, that, that were skeptical about the idea of using this moment as a pretext for launching you know, international you know, wars, nation building, and so forth, place to you know Iraq, I guess, most most particularly and elsewhere, you know, sort of what I would have regarded at the time as sort of Bill O'Reilly treatment of conscientious um, conscientious objectors to our foreign policy, if you will, um, made me feel a little bit sort of, you know, radicalized against against the conservative opposition. Um, and then at the age of 17, George W. Bush reelected. I was uh, I was uh, about five days short of my 18th birthday, so I didn't get to vote in that election. But uh, I, at the age of 17, I was jaded and cynical. <laughs> I was done with politics. All my activism counted for nothing. The other guy won, even though he was clearly wrong. Just that the other, and uh, the system didn't work. You know, I was done um, at the age of 17. wasn't even out of high school yet. But um. You know, I had always been a deep, uh, a deep admirer of the and somebody who, whose whose principal sort of philosophical role model in American history was uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And I believed in a vision 
of American society early on, wherein our commitments to justice, and freedom, and equality were attended by a deep moral commitment to love not only our neighbors and friends, but our opponents and enemies in the context of American politics. Because ultimately, I hope for a society that was one that echoed with the spiritual reconciliation of Dr. King's beloved community. Uh, this idea that we create a society in which, yes, we are judged by the content of our character and the color of our skin, but that beyond that, whether we are religious or not religious, whether we take a statement like this as literal or metaphorical, that we be willing to see one another as, in essence, made in the image of God, and naturally, our brothers and sisters across whatever divides and differences there may be between us. Dr. King had a dream that is deeply humanistic in this way, and that requires us to see beyond the things that differentiate us, even as it is the case that we must not hold back in our articulation of truth and our pursuit of justice. And so when Barack Obama um, sort of arose on the, the national scene uh, in, in uh, 2004, really, his keynote address. I actually didn't see that at the time, uh, but later on, 2007, he started to rev up for his presidential campaign. When I was made aware of him, I, I quickly became inspired by him, but by virtue of both his his story and and this emphasis on hope and change that he brought to American politics. Because for me, it seemed to echo the themes of the beloved community. It seemed to paint a vision, yeah, you know, in. In Kennedy's day, of course, they, they referred to the era of Kennedy as uh, sort of Camelot, you know, this, this idea of this kind of society of idealism and so forth. And we hold each other up to a higher plane of, of, of moral co commitments and we pursue prosperity together in that way. And uh, Obama, you know, he, he had a vision of, of the American future that resonated with me in that sort of way. Um, and so I want, to, I want to pause a little bit and come back to my story uh, and, and pivot at this point to talking a little bit about the origins of, of braver angels, uh, because there's, you know, I, I think it'll help for me to contextualize the work of braver angels uh, if I sort of show how braver angels story and my story sort of meet a little bit. And, and all of that, I think, will set the stage for me being able to speak more effectively about the context of our work in this particular moment, uh, in the aftermath of, of George Floyd, and uh, say a little bit uh, in detail about the, the techniques that we apply to building a community of practice across differences in the context of rebuilding the frayed bonds of trust that exist between the American people. So. You know, about eight years, of course, after the 2008 election, uh, which was marked by this idea of hope and change, and this, you know, even for many Republicans, this transcendent overcoming of the, of the ugliness of our history, the election of not just our first African-American president, but a man who spoke to, again, even in the opinion of many Republicans and conservatives who may, not, may have vehemently disagreed with Barack Obama's policies and may have regarded him Fiction, but even on Fox News, you know, when Obama was nominated, there was a there was a sense of joy in terms of what he represented, and a great a great hopefulness that some of America's uglier historical stains had begun to be overcome. Fast forward eight years, nobody was feeling that way, <laughs> not on the right, not on the uh, not on the left, and um, you know, of course. Donald Trump uh, brought an energy to American politics that, you know, uh, when we voted for him, voted him hard to uh, fairly, uh, wasn't fairly starkly in, in contrast to the, uh, the sort of tone of politics, that, the tone of the campaign that, that, that won in 2008. But of course, we have to, we have to, I have to emphasize that, you know, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton together, according to polling, two most unpopular presidential nominees in, in American history, I think, since, since, that, since that data has been kept. Although I will remind folks 
that Abraham Lincoln didn't even appear on the ballot himself. I mean, he, was, he was so unpopular, but you know, that, that sort of foretells, I guess, what, what happens when you have major, major party nominees who really do only have respect in one part of the country, and not the other, nevertheless. Um, and so it was clear over the course of that election um, with, with historic polarization, with violence, presidential rallies, and, and all, sorts of, all sorts of other things that the American people, uh, our ability to maintain relationships with one another and to work together in order to operate the mechanisms of our government, even before the 2016 presidential election came to pass, the battles between you know, Barack Obama and the, the, the Tea Party led Congress, uh, House of Representatives, our inability to pass budgets, government shutdowns. I know we look back at those days with fondness now. Those were kind of the good old days in comparison to some of what we've seen since then. But it culminated in 2016, where everything seemed to become an episode of House of Cards in some sense. Um, you know, it, it was this radical sort of realization that we are in a place where the foundations of democracy are being threatened by the fact that we, the American people, cannot remain a cannot retain a basic sense of, of trust and empathy and understanding and respect for one another because we have come to see one another as being enemies on the basis of our party affiliation in a way that we never have. And for those who recognize that, some folks wanted to do something about it. Now, um, Braver Angels was originally called an organization called Better Angels. And uh, I'll explain the name change uh, as we go here. But um, it was founded by uh, my boss, David Blank, who's formerly the president of the Institute for American Values. It was co-founded by Professor William Doherty, a professor of psychology at the University of Minnesota, uh, and a man named David Lapp, uh, who grew up on it, who grew up Amish, uh, who is a uh, scholar and community organizer, working class Ohio. And um, after the just after the 2016 election, uh, David Blankenhorn uh, called David Lapp, worked for him, and um, they compared notes in terms of the different mood, different environment in, uh, in their parts of the country. Uh, David Blankenhorn, from Mississippi originally, but he uh, lives, uh, lives in New York with many of you folks, and um, he, he, uh, he mentioned that it, 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 people were walking around uh, like, a, like a bomb had gone off at a hospital just depressed and, and morose and, and in shock that such a thing could happen. And David Lapp and, and his part of Ohio uh, said, well, the, the attitude couldn't be any different here. People are dancing in the streets, more or less, you know, uh, celebrating the election of Donald Trump. And the, the two of them asked each other, um, and, and David Lapp, conservative, socially very conservative, David Blankenhorn, uh, interesting fellow in his opinion, but he's a longtime Democrat, act, activist in the 60s and so forth. But they asked each other, they said, I wonder if it's possible for us to bring together uh, Americans who just voted for Hillary Clinton, just voted for Donald Trump, people who think at least that they hate each other right now, to see if they actually still have some basis for common bond, for, for common trust. And they thought to themselves, well, it's worth a shot because if that's not the case, then each of them feared for the future of the United States of America on account of that. And so David reached out to Bill Doherty, a longtime colleague of his, Bill Doherty, one of America's foremost family therapist. Uh, they have the idea to bring together about a dozen folks who had just voted for Hillary Clinton, a dozen folks who had just voted for Donald Trump in a town in Ohio called South Lebanon that had gone 50-50 in the race. I don't even know whether Trump or Clinton won the count. It was evenly split. And Bill Doherty designed a workshop that would bring together individuals from each of these sides um, over the course of this first workshop, the very work, first workshop, over the course of a three day period, it was an extended engagement, where each side would have the opportunity to speak from the vantage point of their personal and life experiences, their lived experiences, in terms of why they cast the votes that they cast, why they see politics way that they do. But in the course of these guided interactions, they would get the opportunity to hear the human story of the people sitting on the other side of the table 
They would have the opportunity to question each other, but in a framework that demanded good faith, a framework that demanded deep listening from one side to the other. And so people came to this event with deep suspicion, with deep reservations, and credit to David Blatt um, in Ohio, uh, it was credit to his deep relationships in the community that he was able to get these folks to behave. He was somebody who was trusted by both sides. You needed somebody, you often need somebody who has that kind of standing to, 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 to foster these sorts of events. Um, it was a transformational experience for all involved. When the workshop was done, everybody involved uh, in total unanimity said that this was something that needed to happen across the country and they themselves wanted to stay involved in the work of replicating this experience. And that original group of folks is still largely active organizing for Brave for Angels in Ohio. But I'll tell you the story of two individuals in particular whose experience sort of captures the, the inaugural magic of the process that we had, uh, I wasn't involved in, of course, but that, that we had begun to develop this first, uh, this first workshop. Uh, there was a man uh, present at that workshop, Greg Smith. Uh, and Greg uh, was a former small town sheriff, construction worker, evangelical Christian, working class white man, uh, who had cast an enthusiastic ballot uh, for, for Donald Trump. There was another man there uh, named Kuyar Mustafshi, an immigrant from Iran, a liberal Democrat who's leader of the local Democratic uh, Central Committee, I believe, or an active member of the, of the county party. And at some point in the workshop proceedings, uh, Greg, in an op opportunity to have an exchange with Kuyar, uh, said to him something along the lines of, of listen, fella, he said, I, I have a problem. He said, he said I, I have something I want to ask you about. He said, because I have a problem with Islam. He said, and uh, I, can, I can explain my problem with Islam to you with four letters. I, S, I, and before he could put the last S on it, uh, he are interjected. He said, he said, my friend, he said, he said, I know what you're going to say. He said, but let me tell you, my religion has been hijacked by people who don't represent what I believe. He said, can you think of people who hijacked your religion? He said, can you think of people who say they worship the way you do, who do not represent what you believe? And Greg paused and he reflected on the reality of the fact that, you know, you do have Christians who have equated serving, serving Christ and, and serving the God of the Bible uh, with terrorizing people and murdering people on account of their differences, on account of their lifestyles, in a way that couldn't be farther removed from the teachings of the gospel. And Greg responded to Peter's statement by saying, yes, I can think of people like that. You're right. And the two of them began a relationship in that workshop that quickly moved into a friendship that is deep and that persists to this day. And at the end of the workshop, Greg said to, Greg and Kuyar announced to the group um, that was gathered that they intended to continue supporting the work of, of, Brave, of then better angels. All of the time, actually, we didn't have any. <laughs> Just that they would continue to support the work that brought them together. And that furthermore, uh, they had made a commitment to each other. Uh, Kuyar was going to pay a visit uh, to Greg's church, and hear a sermon from, from, Greg's, from Greg's pastor. And Greg would attend uh, a service at Kuyar's mosque. And that together, they would make an effort to understand one another's worlds and where one another come from. Because they had discovered the basis for friendship just by seeing each other's hearts. And they wanted to see if it was possible for them to understand each other more deeply so that they could be a force for, for generating that sort of understanding within their own groups towards the other side. And so the story picks up with better angels with, well, with the original crew, David, Bill, uh, David Lapp, and, and then some others, um, ultimately uh, commissioning a bus and saying, we've got to do this you know, up and down the country. The country needs us. Um, and so Better Angels launched a bus tour 
Somewhere along the way, the name better angels were solidified. NPR picked up the story. Word of mouth began to spread. And suddenly people began reaching out uh, to folks, uh, reaching out to the Better Angels crew as if they were first responders themselves, telling them that polarization was, was, was an emergency in their town, their county, you had people who couldn't talk to each other, the PTA meetings, families that were breaking apart. Can you come to our community? Can you help us? And so the Better Angels bus tour traveled across eastern southern states, um, uh, launching workshops in local communities. They had compressed it into a seven-hour model at the time. And uh, suddenly that became the stretch of time in which Better Angels was born as a membership organization where, where initial workshops were littered across several states. And suddenly people began to join us uh, as, as members and local community organizing groups, bipartisan groups who sought to foster these, these, coming together, these comings together uh, from each side. Now, um, to <laughs> tie it back to my story a little bit, um, all of that took place in the spring and summer of 2017. Um, if we jump back to 2009 very quickly, uh, after Barack Obama was elected, you know, I had a deep desire to expand the movement for hope and change in a way that really brought Republicans and conservatives into the fold. Because I thought, look, if we're going to build the beloved community, if we're going to honor um, the implications of this Obama movement, We've got to understand conservatives. We've got to understand Republicans. Um, I um, took it on myself to start studying conservatives, to start watching Fox News more regularly, listening to, listening to talk radio, studying the things that conservatives and Republicans were saying. But other things happened to me at the same time. I, I grew up a uh, sort of, sort of uh, secular sort of, sort of person, but I met a woman doing fundraised for the Democratic National Committee, actually, and came from a traditional Black Baptist background, religious, religious individual. And uh, we had a confrontation over theology and philosophy, but she uh, said some things that made me think that, well, maybe I ought to read this thing that you call the Bible, because I'm in love with you, and I want to <laughs> be able to understand who you are. And so without getting too deep into it, I experienced something of religious change in, in my life. Uh, I married a woman from traditional Black Baptist background. We moved to Colorado Springs because she joined the army. I found myself in a military town and suddenly all of my friends are soldiers and religious people or all of my friends, uh, you know, had been you know, activists and, uh, and uh, you know, folks are very much to the left. And, um, you know, I, I started reflecting on a number of things. Uh, I'll, I'll pause by saying that, um, you know, well, what all this would lead to is my looking at myself here at one point, realizing that although I think of myself very much as, you know, an individual, somebody who is not particularly in love with what he thinks, I came to the conclusion that I'm more conservative than I realized that I was. Um, it didn't mean, though, that I had hostility towards, you know, towards, towards my democratic past or anybody who registered as a democrat. I just looked up one day and I and when I thought about the importance of the role of religion in society, when I thought in new ways about the ways in which the market economy can create prosperity and opportunity for people, and when I looked at African American history from a more conservative vantage point, various things made me think that, you know, not only am I more conservative than I realize, not only does observing religious life up close uh, and military life up close make me think that there's value in these institutions and so forth. But I also think that given the fact that at the end of the day, you know, I still see value in the views of the left as well as seeing the value in the views of the right. And the experiences, even more important than just the opinions, the experiences that inform these views, I very much want to be a bridge between people on each side of these conversations, left and right, black and white. Um, and so fast forward a little bit, when we moved back to Los Angeles after my wife left the army, we started a family. And I wanted to be a voice for this sort of this sort of way of looking at politics, which is the sort of way of looking at politics that I felt that Barack Obama represented and that ultimately echoed forth from Dr. King's nonviolent movement. And so I, long story short, I ran for Congress uh, as a hope and change Republican, which made me a unicorn among unicorns, uh, you know, the sort of the political landscape. 
And I would tell a story when people ask, ask me about why I was running it and why I thought I could, at the age of 26, sort of represent people from different ends of the universe in, in, in a very complicated demographically diverse Los Angeles district. Um, whether I was speaking to a black democratic leaning church in South Central Los Angeles, where I lived, or to a white Tea Party club in South Bay, LA County, I would tell people that I come from a unique family background in some respects. Uh, my mother is a liberal black Democrat from inner city Los Angeles. Uh, my father is a conservative white Republican from Tennessee. I grew up explaining my father to my mother and my mother to my father, and that's why I think I can represent all of you folks, right? Uh, which was always, you know, a good line for, <laughs> for a laugh, uh, regardless of uh, what side of the aisle I was speaking to. Um, my parents divorced when I was young. Uh, my mother, uh, you know, uh, and I don't want to over exaggerate this, but my mother, my mother came from the hood. Uh, she knew deep struggles in her life as a young, as a young girl, and made a life and a career for herself, uh, which is testament course, to, you know, to the possibilities of American life and persevere, but she also endured the hardships of history that visited themselves on many poor people and African Americans in particular, I think, in the places where she grew up. My father came from the South. My father came from Tennessee, um, but then moved to Los Angeles and enjoyed tremendous wealth. My grandfather was a very successful man in the record business. Uh, my father is older than my mother. My father was born uh, in, in deep privilege. 1950, my mother was born in the 60s. Uh, and um, they came from different worlds, they came from different universes. They would get into these, not about politics directly, but the differences their culture were stark. And I remember their shouting matches. They were both headstrong personalities. They had that in common. And I remember being four years old or so, um, one of my earlier memories hearing them screaming at each other in the living room, me running in between the two of them, putting my hands over my ears and saying, stop shouting at each other, shouting at them, stop shouting at each other. And um, I realized more recently in my life that I guess I've been doing that sort of thing with people ever since. I had three native environments growing up in my life. I lived, um, I would visit my mother's family uh, in South Central LA, in Inglewood. I would go into neighborhoods with my my uh, my young uncle and uh, you know we take the bus around the inner city and I knew there are certain places that we couldn't step into with the wrong color shoelaces on because if we did we might not come out the other side. We knew that we had to be careful around police officers because there was a risk uh, in in not being so. Um, but then I would spend time with my father's family in La Jolla, California, a coastal community, affluent place. My grandparents lived in a house. Uh, multi-million dollar view of the ocean, just a few blocks down the street from Mitt Romney's house, the one with the car elevator that we used to talk about in 2012. But from day to day, I grew up in multicultural middle-class Culver City uh, with Jewish uh, kids, and Korean and Japanese kids, Black and Latino kids and so forth, uh, the fourth most diverse school district in America, as I understand it. And um, so those are my environments growing up. And I have, I have in addition to you know, coming from a household that's biracial, black and white. I have cousins who, on each side who are half Mexican, half Parisian, half Brazilian. I've got an uncle who's Jewish. And so um, I, I grew up being very sensitive to the reality of the fact that even if my mother and father couldn't see the good in each other, that I could see the good in each of them. And that it made sense to me why they saw the world in different ways. Because they had different experiences and different struggles. And yet, it's what was certainly true is that they too had seen good in each other at some point. And it was only when they lost track of their ability to, to, to understand each other across the aspects of one another that they could not understand, I think, that things began to break down uh, in my family. And so, you know, fast forwarding again, um, in 2000 and, uh, in, in, well, I was elected vice chairman of the Republican Party, as mentioned earlier, that was 2015. I tried to bring the total change philosophy to the GOP on an institutional level. I wanted to create, um, create trust and relationship between Republicans and Democrats in Los Angeles. I wound up having people wanting to throw me out of the party for, for being too nice to the wrong Republicans. That's how nasty things were. And so I left uh, the party in terms of being in 
institutions involved with it, of course, I remain a registered Republican, um, and sought to create sort of a media network that would lift up voices that were not right or left, but right and left, people who disagreed about politics, but who agreed about how we ought to treat each other. Um, had uh, a lot of headaches and rocky starts until finally uh, this media venture was sort of stopped in its tracks by, and I won't get into this, but by a multi-billion dollar company who had a similar name, even though they were in a wildly different uh, sort of line of business. But at that time, somebody pointed me in the direction of a group called Better Angels. And Better Angels was an organization that was bringing people together on the ground, American community in precisely the spirit that I was hoping to help people come together in. They didn't have a digital media strategy or anything like that, but they had people who were actively organizing. And I thought, well, maybe my experience and so forth can be of benefit to, to these folks. And so I went down and I sat in on a workshop at San Diego uh, and experienced the magic of the same process that brought Greg Smith and Kudar Mustafi together um, uh, several, months, several months before. And I met David Blankenhorn. I told him about my media network idea. And I very quickly, and you know, he learned about my story. And very quickly, um, Better Angels expanded to include a media dimension. Uh, we launched a fledgling media network at the time called the Better Angels Media Network, the Better Angels Podcast. And, and um, I quickly became uh, a general spokesperson, strategist for the organization. And um, it was an experience like nothing I could I can describe to you folks because I had always been interested in politics. I had always been moved by the possibility of bringing out the best in people through the exchange of ideas and experiences. But the realities of politics, the business end of politics, has been nasty and bitter as long as I can remember observing it, as long as I had been in it. But in Better Angels, we were able to deal with these issues and conversations in a way that brought out the very best in people, that brought out the Better Angels of our nature, right? And so fast forward, over the course of, of three years, Better Angels became Braver Angels. I promise I'll explain that in a moment. But today, Braver Angels stands as America's largest grassroots bipartisan organization dedicated to the work of depolarization. From an initial handful in South Lebanon, Ohio, we now boast 10,000 dues paying members, Republicans and Democrats from across American society. Uh, we have 80, about 80 or so local Braver Angels alliances. You can think of them as bipartisan chapters, actively organizing from Los Angeles to Austin, to New York, to elsewhere across America. Um, we are active in four sectors of society and increasingly five. Uh, politics and government. Uh, just a few weeks ago, Bill Doherty testified before the Select Committee for the Modernization of Congress. Brave Angels workshops of the type I've started to describe to you are now being actively conducted among congressional staffers, union members of Congress themselves. We are active on college campuses and in university life and academia. We have a very popular debates program and a partnership with an organization called Bridge USA. It creates spaces for Republicans and Democrats, and not Republicans and Democrats, but students from across the spectrum of, of perspectives, social justice advocates, traditional or heterodox liberals, and so forth, to come together and to debate issues in a way that uplifts intellectuals' humility in the pursuit of truth. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, collaborations in the media space, of course, relationships with journalists and thought leaders, and media projects, uh, media networks, still fledgling, I would argue, but has expanded to have deep reach and the influencer spaces of American politics. I am a co-host of the Braver Angels podcast. We'll be launching a John Wood Jr. show uh, next week. By the way, the Braver Angels podcast, for those who haven't heard it, uh, was, I am proud to say, as of December 2020, was listed as the 159th most popular political podcast in America, which doesn't sound like much until you remember that there are 20,000 uh, podcasts about politics in the, in the United States, so really not too bad. We have a singer-songwriter, 150 strong people who conduct events and programming that revolves around music, people who contribute uh, art to our work in a way that allows us to communicate our humanity to each other uh, beyond what we can accomplish through debate and dialogue oftentimes. Um, but our work is concentrated in the grassroots and in local communities. And so 
At the foundation of everything else that I've described, there lies a suite of workshops and activities that give people the opportunity to deepen their capacity for understanding and communicating with people on the other side so as we can cultivate community together so as to preserve the functionality of our institutions and democracy's ability to endure. So I'll describe uh, a little bit the details of those, those offerings. So we have something called a depolarizing within workshop. And our depolarizing within workshop is one that focuses in on cultivating internal discipline in terms of our internal dialogue about the other side. So often, we find ourselves unquestioningly accepting the partisan narratives that flow into our psychology, TV screen, talk radio, social media, so on, so on and so forth. And it creates an image of who the other human beings are in the political conversation, which turns them and reduces them to stereotypes and caricatures, such that every time you see somebody on the left, if you're somebody on the right, a radical communist, and if you're somebody on the left seeing somebody on the right, uh, you, what you see perhaps is a racist or potentially somebody who could be a fascist X, Y, and Z, as opposed to somebody who may be right or wrong in their opinions, but it's the product of a definite human experience. Our depolarizing within workshop provides exercises and guides and recommended readings and tools to allow people to deepen their understanding of the nuances and the complexities experiences on the other side of the aisle so that the story they tell themselves is not the simple polarization driven sort of cynical narratives that frequently come to us through media establishments that have a vested interest in dividing the American people. We have an offering called a Skills for Bridging the Divide workshop, which teaches the art of empathetic communication and how it is we can communicate with one another so as to open the space for listening, to open the space for common ground, and even if we fail to disagree, these techniques allow us to be able to signal our goodwill towards the other party in the conversation so that social trust can be established even if disagreement finds itself beyond reach, or even if agreement finds itself beyond reach. Um, and I'm happy to say a little bit about the particulars of that sort of, sort of communication. As a matter of fact, I'll just give a useful acronym for, for understanding part of what that in that workshop. Uh, there's something that Bill Doherty developed called the LAP formula. It'll be familiar to you guys, uh, given your backgrounds, uh, probably similar to other things that you that you may teach your practice, but LAP, L-A-P-P, the idea that you listen first, you deeply listen to what the other person is saying. Uh, a, for acknowledge, you acknowledge what the other person is saying in terms that reflect the language that they themselves might use to describe their own point of view. So if you're a person on the, on the, on the right, let's say listening to someone on the left uh, make, their, make the case for why it is their pro-choice, you don't say, oh, you're somebody who doesn't care about unborn babies and so forth. You would say, if you are listening to that person that, okay, I understand that you're a person who cares deeply about a woman's right to choose what she does with her own body, because that is part of her, of her, in your view, in her, of her innate rights and her, her ability uh, to operate as a fully equal member of society, sovereign control of her own person. Um, you would speak in language that resonates with the way that person sees the issue for themselves. And if you're a person on the left speaking to somebody on the right who believes, in, let's say, a libertarian sort of laissez-faire kind of economic philosophy, you have the option of saying, oh, you just don't care about poor people. But if you're listening to that person, what you'll probably understand and what you would say to them in reflecting their, their beliefs, your understanding of their beliefs, is words along the lines of, okay, you're a person who believes that the free market lifts all boats, that it creates opportunity for even the poorest of people to be able to make the most out of their lives and to achieve social mobility in, in America. When we hear uh, each other in our own languages and discipline ourselves to be able to reflect the opinions of the other side in the terms that they would use to understand those opinions for themselves and communicate those opinions themselves, we signal to the other side that we actually respect them enough to listen to them and to charitably and deeply understand um, the substance of their point of view. And so P, 
the next P is for the first P is for pivot. We listen, we acknowledge, we pivot, and it's a small step, but it is a vital one. Wherein, through the use of an I statement, perhaps as opposed to a truth statement, and I suppose you folks probably understand the distinction there, but you might say something along the lines of, I, I, I understand that this is your point of view on this issue. Um, I have a different experience, or, or my opinion is, is, is a bit is a bit different, or, you know, I, I look at this uh, in a different way, but, but here's why, right? You emphasize your, you emphasize your subjectivity, you emphasize the fact that this is your point of view, not because you don't perhaps know it in fact to be a fact, but because you want to signal humility that invites that person to be humble themselves in listening to you now, offering your perspective, and then you do offer that perspective. But by the time you get to the point of the last P, offering perspective, you have created psychological and emotional space in the other part for them to listen to you truly and deeply because you have taken the time to listen to them. And so these are the skills we teach, or some of the skills we teach in our Skills for Good and Divide workshop. We have our Red and Blue workshop, which I've already explained uh, a little bit, but I'll go into deep detail here. So this is the workshop model that was condensed uh, after that first workshop with Greg and Kudar in, in Ohio. And the, um, the way this workshop works, and this is probably our, this is our most famous offering. This one has been covered by just about every major media outlet in, in America, uh, just about. But we bring small groups of folks from left and right into a shared space, again, not to argue, debate politics, but to speak from lived experience in terms of why they see politics, the, the way that they do. Um, the first exercise in that workshop, after each side has had the opportunity to introduce each other, uh, and then there are two moderators for these workshops. One moderator will go with one side into one room, the other will go with the other side into another room. Uh, the first exercise is called a stereotypes exercise. Each side lists out stereotypes that the most common stereotypes they see as being held by the other side towards them. And that list will vary, but certain parts of it are, are, are almost always a given. The list for conservatives, conservatives will almost always say, you know, as their top thing that, oh, the other side sees us as racist. And, you know, maybe they see us as hating poor people or being anti-science. And on the left, in the blue side, um, as opposed to the red side, uh, the list will frequently start with something like, oh, the other side says we hate America, or we're unpatriotic. Or maybe that we want the government to run everybody's lives, or that we want to move shop the state, et cetera, et cetera. That we're communists, that, we're, that we hate religion, et cetera, et cetera. And each side lists these stereotypes, but they are also asked to reflect on whether or not there may be a kernel of truth in each stereotype. And so frequently, conservatives will look at the list of stereotypes and say, well, conservatism is not racism. Racism has nothing to do with Conservatism, on the other hand, we recognize the fact that there are racists who vote Republican, there are racists who present themselves as conservatives, and we should do more to make sure that those folks don't feel comfortable in our camp, uh, make clear that conservatism is not racism, and to show why it's not. And in the blue group, you'll frequently have people say, well, you know, the reason we criticize America is because we love America. Dissent is patriotic, but maybe there's some folks on our side who are who are so critical of America that they've lost sight of any of the good things that we have to offer, and we should be mindful of that as well. So each side gets the opportunity to present to the other side this list of stereotypes that they see the other group is having about them, why they feel these stereotypes are not accurate, but also to concede or reflect on the, on the ways in which there may be some truth to some of these stereotypes. So that's an example of one exercise in the Red Blue Workshop, and there are others conduct a fishbowl exercise. I imagine folks in this call may be familiar with that technique, but I'm happy to say a little bit more about that. Um, we also have something called a Brave Angels uh, debate program, and I'm not even listing all of our offers. We have workshops specifically for families who are impacted by politics. We have one-to-one -one conversational models for people to be able to empathize across racial divides and political and even geographic divides. Um, but to tell you a little bit about our Brave Angels workshop, uh, it was des designed by, uh, by my friend and colleague, uh, April Lawson, formerly of the Aspen Institute, and uh, formerly actually an assistant to Dave Brooks, the New York Times. And um, this is a debate model 
that is modeled off of the sort of, you know, Yale student, uh, the Yale debate model, which itself is a, a, a sort of a, a bit of an appropriation of the uh, British uh, parliamentary model, wherein you have people from all walks of life in American society, and you can have a group of 150 people in a room, potentially. And we've had Zoom debates uh, that have had in breakout rooms up to 800 people or so, you know, uh, debating a given resolution, resolve, defund the police, or resolve, build the wall. I mean, in this context, we go for provocative setups. But the idea is to have a resolution that splits the room, in which you have people who may be professional policy folks, who may be people with certain vocational backgrounds, but but which will certainly include, and most include, just ordinary Americans from all walks of life who have an opinion on the issue. The point of this format, in which everybody just has the opportunity to give a two or three or four minute, a short uh, speech uh, on a given issue, uh, with a short amount of time for questioning, for questioning from from the other participants, with the moderator in the middle who encourages the participants or who steers the participants in the direction of, in this case, to, to give a format detail, to not address their questions to the speaker, but to address their questions to the chairperson. Because in this context, what we want to do is prevent a contest of egos and personality, but to open the space for an articulation of perspective, but also lived experience in the context of substantiating the reasons for our point of view in the context of debate. Um, the Brave Rangers debate model uh, uplifts intellectual humility. It is an opportunity to share your data and to share your logic, but also an opportunity to share the experience that informs your perspective and an opportunity to be honest about your doubts, and to be honest about the things that perhaps you believe or think or suspect, but that you're not completely sure about in terms of why you see a certain political issue the way that you do. It is a debate context where you actually have permission to change your mind on a subject in the middle of the debate and switch sides. It doesn't happen too often, but it is firmly, it is squarely within, within the rules. It is an opportunity to say, well, I think that this is true because I've experienced this and this is what I've read, but I don't entirely know. Um, but this is why I feel the way that I, this is why that I, why I think the way that I do. And this is, this is what I would say to persuade you that there's some value in my opinion. It is a debate, and you know, <clears throat> people people lock horns in that context. But it is a context that ultimately shows us how we can challenge each other and persuade each other while keeping one another's humanity and human dignity front and center, front front and center. Pardon me, so that we can remain in community with each other when the debate is done, which is precisely the goal we should be striving for in the context of American politics, broadly speaking, where every election must not ultimately be a matter of life and death if it, if, it is, if it is the case that we expect a democracy within which the pendulum of power will always swing back and forth to endure. And so this is something of the arc of Brave Rangel's uh, intervention and facilitated offering. And people who come through these experiences find themselves not only impacted by the experiences themselves, but nested in relationships and a community that is both national and local in dimension that gives them a base of support, if you will, to be able to carry this consciousness, consciousness back with them into their institutions, into their campuses, into their workplaces, into local governments, into their into their living rooms and kitchen tables as individuals who are now empowered to model this 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 patriot this what I call patriotic empathy this this skill and character of American uh, political discourse which says that your love for your country is demonstrated by the concern that you bear for your fellow Americans it equips these those who go through our process with the attitude and the relationship and the grounding to model that way of being in the context of American society and in their own lives. So I think that I've gone a little bit long with my remarks. I think we have about 10 minutes and I, I will have to leave sharply at that point. I'm sorry, I should have I should have probably landed a few minutes earlier because I forgot I was leaving early.
uh, just like that. I, but, but I'm very grateful to everybody here for, for listening um, to me. And I'm happy to field a, a question or two uh, in the few minutes we have. In the few minutes we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, on the, there's been a very lively discussion among participants about the link between Christianity and racism and some of the philosophical writings about it. We don't have questions yet. So if you have more to talk about, say for angels, braver angels, mm -hmm. safer, braver, <laughs> um, uh, keep going for a few more minutes. <laughs> well, you know, questions, but <clears throat> yeah, well, I think I've told my tale, but I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, um, I guess I'm happy to speak to the religious uh, point that you just, that you just raised for, for a moment. So, you know, many people thought that uh, Better Angels was a faith-based organization, that Brave Angels. Uh, we are not, but, uh, but religious people and people of faith certainly deeply inform and enrich the culture of our organization. And we have folks involved in our organization across, from across denominations, Catholics, Unitarians, Jews and Muslims, uh, and more, uh, evangelical Christians. And, um, you know, I, I think that as a broad principle, what we want to do is to tap into, tap into the, the philosophical traditions and the wisdom traditions that come both from, from, from religion and secular society so as to be able to sort of inform the way we communicate and empathize with each other. Um, you know, again, I harken back to nonviolence, which was, of course, you know, in Dr. King's tradition inspired by the gospel, but which was inspired by Gandhi, uh, who himself obviously was an observant uh, Hindu. But King was also a humanist. King was a person who studied the Enlightenment, who studied classical philosophy and so forth. And I think that, you know, if, 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 if you look at you know, our, our traditions, um, the ones that call us to higher ways of being, they all, I think, ultimately would turn us to a perspective that says that we must love our neighbors as we love ourselves if we are going to create the sort of society that we want to see. Now, that doesn't mean that the difference in religious perspectives isn't important. Uh, that also doesn't mean that religion cannot be used and manipulated for purposes that are utterly at odds with those principles. We know that. So, you know, I mean, those things are worth acknowledging. But we encourage people to bring their, their faith-based philosophical perspectives with them into conversation, just to sort of strive after the higher sorts of, the higher sorts of uh, moral and spiritual teachings that are contained within those traditions. But if we do that, that should help us nurture the soil for empathy and grace in society. And so, you know, we encourage people not to necessarily leave those things at the door. They can bring those parts of their identity with them, because we want the whole person to come through and to, to be a part of the culture that we're creating. We do have questions here. Um, first one is, uh, what's the racial uh, distribution of members of Braver Angels? Right, yeah, well, it's a great question. I will tell you that one of our fundamental challenges is on a membership level, achieving a more balanced sort of representation, demographic representation of American society. Um, our, our membership started as strongly, strongly white, strongly middle class, and, uh, and more left wing than, than right wing, to be sure. But that's not the same demographic spread as the people who participate in our programs. Part of the issue is, is, is economically related. Um, members are also volunteers, uh, oftentimes. Well, we've got about 1,500 registered volunteers across the country, but, they're, but our, our members are oftentimes either volunteers or people with financial means to sustain as members. And membership is cheap. I mean, you know, a dollar a month can allow you to be a member of Braver Angels. But, you know, people who are in a position to sort of actively engage with our work as volunteers, uh, who are financially comfortable uh, paying for membership are frequently people with means, frequently people with time at their disposal. And so we have to go out of our way much more to get working class people into the mix, uh, to get many people of color uh, into, the, into our actual membership roles. What we know is that our programs are impacted 
for people across the spectrum of American politics, ethnic identity, and experience. I mean, you know, we we have uh, uh, we have I think ample experience to be able to demonstrate that. But we have to work a lot harder uh, to get people of color, particularly. And I would say that there are there are I would say that the most difficult areas for us. This may be preemptive question, but I would say that the most difficult areas of outreach for us certainly are younger social justice oriented activists of color on the one hand, and very committed uh, sort of uh, Trump supporting um, working class white voters, particularly older white voters on the other hand, right? Um, those are areas in which the skepticism towards this sort of work can be very deep. And it's not surprising, obviously. You can argue that that's representative of the most, you know, perhaps some of the more polarized constituencies and so forth. Um, and so right now, we do not reflect America, demographically speaking, in the way we will have to if we are going to achieve our larger mission uh, at a greater level of scale with a greater degree of impact. But that is front and center of something that we are working to accomplish. And so for anybody on this call who's interested in being involved in our work, that would be a project that you, in one way or the other, would like to be involved with uh, as well uh, as we broaden out our outreach and bring the whole of America family. More deeply in the fold. All right, we've got three minutes by my clock. Yeah. Um, two questions. One is uh, at a dollar a pop, who's really covering the costs of the work of the organization? Mm -hmm. And the other one is in your debate forum, how many people on each side? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, so the uh, uh, as far as our fundraising goes, so first of all, it is. $12 uh, a year minimum. Most people actually do choose to give quite a bit more. I think that we get about a third right now of our of our funding uh, from membership dues, which is pretty strong. Um, the rest uh, comes from individual donors who donated higher levels and from foundation partners. Okay. And we have something called the Brave Angels Rule. In, in Brave, Brave Angels what? The Brave Angels Rule, which is that we are evenly bipartisan or evenly red and blue balance on each level of leadership and also in terms of our, our funding. So we reach out to conservative foundations and progressive foundations to support our work. It's fairly, you know, fairly even spread. Um, our foundation money probably keeps it a little bit more blue in part because conservatives don't drop in dollars up until now seem to be more skeptical of this work, but I'm hoping to change that. Um, but that's about the spread. Uh, about the spread in terms of the sources of our, the categories of our funding. And uh, as far as how many people participate in the debate, you know, it varies pretty wildly. You can have a debate with 50 people. Um, you could have a debate with 20. You could have a debate with 200. I've seen all different sizes. And that's in person. On Zoom, it's, you know, it's, you can have, again, like I said, if, we, if we're running multiple breakout rooms, we could have 800 or so people in a given gathering, uh, which is pretty Pretty remarkable. And then a question on equity. Have you run programs on equity? You know, so I wish I had more time to engage this question. Let me let me give, give my broader perspective on, on this on this one. First of all, equity is a is a deeply important term that has different meanings to different people to some degree. I think that we sometimes find ourselves, and I frequently find myself in discourse over diversity, equity, and inclusion sort of work broadly speaking. And part of what I try to stress is sort of the non-contradiction, if you will, between empathy and, and equity. Oftentimes people take an approach to facilitation, and I imagine we have many practitioners in this room, and I'd love to continue this conversation, but oftentimes- John, can I just- Yeah. Can I just interrupt for a second? Because the person who posed the question is clarifying whether or not people have a basic human right for basic human needs, education, healthcare, housing, food, that might help you. Right, right, precisely, yeah. Well, so the, the bottom line on this is that because we are bringing people together from across the ideological spectrum, we do not make people commit to certain sorts of philosophical, or ideological or political principles going into a conversation because if we do that, they won't come into the conversation. Mm -hmm. What we try to do is set the stage for interpersonal empathy and understanding 
that acknowledges the human dignity and the dignity and the identity of each party in the conversation. But from that foundation, we are able to have meaningful conversations about equity and about human rights and about the need for us to be able to honor the unique experiences of people who exist across the spectrum of privilege, but who may be more vulnerable in many places, of many cases, than people who are on other parts of that spectrum of American life. But it is only through establishing the foundation for social trust that we can get there in a meaningful way. Because if we go right to those conversations without that social trust, the foundation from it, for it collapses, the floor dis disappears from beneath your feet and people get hurt and angry without ever coming to the point of being able to more effectively understand it. So. I gotta let you go, it's 9.46. Thank you so much. I wish you'd come to my house. I live with a guy who's a conservative and I'm a liberal. But sure, sure. Go in peace and get to that plane. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love you guys. I appreciate it. Thank um, you. I hope to talk to you all again. Thank you so much, John. Good luck getting your plane. Thanks, John. <laughs> all right. Chuck, I believe we're passing the microphone over to you, mister. Well, thank you very much. I want it. Am I? Yeah, unmuted. Good. Um, uh, on the 20th anniversary of... Um, Oh my gosh, there's the conservative walking behind you, Julie. Yeah, yeah, he's here. <laughs> he wants to be heard. <laughs> um, on the 20th anniversary of the listserv and the um, uh, and these breakfasts, um, I, I thought it might be nice if we could open the floor uh, to people to um, give any comments they have about uh, Maria Volpe, the person who made both of these possible um, created both of them out of thin cloth in about two weeks, um, and, and each of which has become um, a, an indispensable mainstay for ADR, certainly in New York and, and more generally around the country and the world. I've heard Maria say often that sleep is overrated, and she seems to take that personally because you get emails from her at, at 1.30 a.m. and then oh. again at 6 a.m. <laughs> um, and uh, what I'm thinking here is that we open the floor and take this opportunity with a few extra minutes to um, uh, to, to open the floor to everyone to whatever their comments about Maria are. Mine just really quickly are that um, to a remarkable degree, um, she's of course a full professor of sociology at John Jay College in CUNY, um, but she is one of those unique professors who is both an academic, I, I don't know, turning out five papers a year, some ridiculous number, um, and a teacher and a mentor, and not only a mentor and teacher to her own students at John Jay, but um, really to so many of us in the field. Um, I think it is fair to say that without the listserv and the and these breakfasts, uh, alternative dispute resolution, certainly in New York, maybe more broadly, would not be what they are uh, today without them. Um, the breadth, the scope, the depth, uh, and the reach of ADR, uh, I think, are all directly related to these institutions and lots of other things that Maria has done. Yeah. Um, when, when people ask me, what do I do to get started in mediation? I said, if you, I would say, I often say, if you want to be serious about ADR in New York and you don't know Maria Volpe, fix that. Um, and uh, it, it was certainly true for me. And I think it may be true for many of the people on this call uh, that our um, uh, interest, love, commitment, to ADR uh, was, if not created, certainly nurtured by Maria Volpe. And Maria, on the 20th anniversary of these things, thank you so much. Yay, Maria. <laughs> it's a quiet group today, by and large. If anyone else has any other comments, I'd love to hear them. Speak up, unmute yourself and speak well, up. I can I can just remember and acknowledge uh, the 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 shift in uh, in membership and and attendance from a time when roundtable meant 
sitting at a round right. table with maybe about 15 people. So this was this is really remarkable. Uh, and, uh, and I'm really, yeah, I'm really, um, I really want to acknowledge uh, Julie and, uh, and, um, and Maria and Chuck and, uh, and the rest that, that have made this grow to, to these wonderful proportions. I just Helen, want has, Helen has her hand raised. I just want to say that I um, can't give enough appreciation for Maria and all that she does. Um, she created this platform. I'm sure it brings her as much pain as joy sometimes, but she, <laughs> but she balances it. That's well. why she has us. <laughs> yes, yeah. You know, she balances it well. She gives everybody a voice. And um, I just want to thank you for being you and for being brave, for being a visionary and for making this happen and for always making this Higgy feel very welcome. <laughs> All right. I, uh, I raise my hand. Uh, I always feel like I'm in danger of, uh, of seeming like a, uh, an obsequious psychophant when I speak about Maria because I just, uh, I'm just in awe of her, her energy, uh, her uh, indefatig indefatigability. I, I don't think I pronounced that correctly, but uh, she, I'm in awe. She's like the Terminator, uh, Energizer Bunny, whichever, which, however, whichever uh, analogy or <laughs> like to use uh and just it's motivated i think just by a deep passion and care for not only the subject matter of dispute resolution but also for you know the uh for her students and for all those who are interested in, in conflict resolution i've seen her many times uh you know stick it be in the middle of a um of a, of a dispute and i think all of us have seen that that where i just I just don't know that I would have the patience. <laughs> I just feel very humbled um, by her, uh, you know, what a stalwart she is. And uh, so um, uh, kudos to, uh, to, uh, to Maria and uh, thank you. Yeah. And sometime, somehow or other, Maria always finds time for everyone. I don't know how she expands the day to do that. But that's it's that's the part true. about sleep, Tom. <laughs> well, that's one part of it, but that still would only leave 24 hours. <laughs> I just so, want to say, it, oh, go, go ahead. You know, I was just going to say, this really should not be about me. I mean, we do have a listserv and a breakfast and um, it would be great to hear the value of those, um, what life was like 20 years ago today when we didn't have a way of communicating in real time uh, or face to face now, uh, you know, virtually. But yeah, um, it, sleep is a waste of time in my world. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Let's continue the conversation about the listserv and the, the breakfast. You um, control everything, Maria. <laughs> Mark, you have your hand up. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to sort of pick up on what Maria said in that um, I see her so much as a catalyst. I think the people she touches directly benefit tremendously and she touches so many. But I think the... Um, the vision for seeing the field in such um, in, with such diversity, and and the uh, the uh, and and the ACRGNY and model with with Don Jay as bringing together so many aspects of conflict resolution, it really enables you to see the commonality and see the breadth and see what kind of a uh, community and what kind of a mission we're all on. And I think that, that to me, that's the most powerful thing that a catalyst can do is, you know, uh, to, uh, to generate that kind of energy for a uh, positive energy. So I, I really, I, I totally appreciate her, this process and the, the group. Whitney. Um, I just wanted to say, as somebody who is maybe a little newer to this group that I've had done since 
kind of COVID has changed all of our lives. And I've really appreciated this very, very dependable time to be able to meet everybody and talk to people who otherwise would just be names on, you know, names on lists and stuff. So thank you all. I've really appreciated this. And Maria, there are a million comments in the chat um, from all kinds of friends, some a little shyer than others. <laughs> but, um, I'm, I'm tempted to say on behalf of all of us, we wouldn't be here without you. It's that simple. And we're so grateful. And I'll stick around for another 14 years if I have. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me how old I'll be. But <laughs> Folks, we I have to apologize. I would, I would love to stay for the end of this, but I do have to get to a 10 o'clock. But Maria, thank you very much. And to everyone who contributes to the listserv, who raise, who 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 uh, reads the listserv, who follows it, everyone who comes and and listens and speaks at these breakfasts, thank you all so much. Yeah, and Chuck, you you I know you have to go, but you do bring up an important topic. We get heated sometimes. We have very strong feelings on issues, even though we're dispute resolvers. And one of the great things most of the time about the listserv and certainly the breakfasts is that we respect one another much as John Wood was promoting. We listen, we maybe respond, repeat, reflect, and respect one another. And I hope that always is a feature of participation in the listserv and in the breakfasts. And with that, thank I you, Julie. I think we're done here. I'm, I think there are two whether, whether hands people stay on, I'm going to run. But um, happy, oh. um, happy Labor Day to everybody. Oh, Chuck. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Thank you, Chuck. I'll see you soon. Okay, oh, sweetness and Marquita in that order. Yes. Yes. Peace and blessings. Uh, thank you to Maria and everyone connected to Maria, and then that makes me connected to Maria and that is what I wanted to share today is that um, I, I miss showing up in that room um, over at John Jay, that was eventful for me, that was special for me. However, I am, I am moved to share that as we give Maria her very, um, she's afforded these um, accolades she is and and we love her and thank you so uh for me a way to extend my appreciation to people for what they do that directly impacts me is to show up and be my best self so wherever i'm going to show up and be my best self that would be saying thank you to maria for what the platform she has created so that we don't crumble that we don't go into despair from things that we have to face. We have to look at these things, 9-11, um, COVID, and many things, many things, uh, New Orleans, many things, um, Afghanistan, many things that are happening, but we do have this space where we, we know we don't have to crumble and we have access to um, many people with different gifts and talents. So, uh, Maria, I want to say to you that um, I owe you my best self, and I promise to give the world my best self. So thank you um, so much to everyone, and I am complete. Thank you. Marquita. I think I'm just uh, echoing what you just said, uh, your sweetness. I miss you, Your name disappeared, but uh, that's, that's how I'm going to remember you, given what you just said. Um, Maria, I hear your, I heard your discomfort and having people tribute you right now. And um, I think for, I appreciate that this is a space to do so. And also if it helps you to think about why that's important right now, cause you're all about utility, sleep being uh, valueless. As far as I can see what you have created in this community will be all the more important in the next 20 years. So I just, uh, I'm sort of thinking about it as a retrospective and a prospective and appreciating everything you've done to lay the groundwork for uh, 
a number of things that many of us will continue to work on uh, in the next, who knows how long. So thank you. I love people giving you your flowers now. That's what I'd say. With love. <laughs> I think we've got all the hands raised. I think. We're going to sign off now and we'll see you next month. And thank you all for your contributions and your support. And most of all, thank you, Maria. Well, thank you to everyone. I don't want anyone to think that any of this was by design. You know, when we look back, it looks like it was all planned. Oh. But, you know, we're often doing all of these things. And when we look back, weren't we sort of doing this by the seat of our pants? We we're taking risks. And I think we're sort of guided by some very simple values and principles that respect is really important and that we all count and that we have to keep, um, at least from my perspective, something like this breakfast barrier free so that it was always a free um, forum when we were in person and it continues to be free online and if we ever get back to an in-person, you know, we're not permitted to have large gatherings at the college, um, that it will continue to be free, you know, in terms of physical barriers, but also free for us to associate. And uh, hopefully we can model this for the rest of the world on how we um, can communicate both personally, uh, in person and uh, virtually. Thank you everyone for, um, everything you've said and for being part of my life. Have a great day. Thank you to the committee that helps to make these breakfasts possible every month. Julie, Chuck, uh, Matthew and Nikki uh, couldn't do it without uh, the co-creators and co-conveners. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.